right on top of old Fort York, the same fort the Americans burned down when they captured the town of York in 1812. What craziness, she thought. And she set about showing how the intelligent way to extend Front Street could be done if you had to do it, although that was something she had not been convinced of. And the way you do it is by building at grade along the north side of the railway tracks a new but traditional street connecting Bathurst to Dufferin. Jane Jacobs, when she heard of Kathy's proposal, was impressed. And her innovative problem-solving approach entirely changed the way people looked at the expressway extension. And finally, having looked at it for a long time, City Hall agreed that any extension of Front Street was a bad way to spend money, and the idea was finally abandoned. As that issue was being discussed, there was thought about what to do about the Gardner Expressway. And Kathy was appointed by City Hall as co-chair of the Gardner Lakeshore Task Force. Now this idea of demolishing the, the Gardner was a wildly divisive idea. But of course, Kathy found a way to move ahead. She agreed that the place to start was tearing down the section of the Gardner east of the Don River. And by bringing people inside and outside of City Hall together to move the project forward, she had created enough of a consensus to get City Hall approval. That demolition happened so long ago that, were it not for the remnants of the old ramps that have been carefully preserved near Leslie Street, few would remember that this section of the elevated road had ever existed. Once again, Kathy earned her mark as a great city builder. Her determination and optimism bore fruit. For the last decade, some of her energy, and she's got a lot of it, has been directed to protecting our built heritage. In the 1990s, she was connected with a distant relative, Sir James Dunbar Naismith, a leading architect in Scotland with a reputation for enhancing existing structures and creating great performance spaces. Sir James introduced her to a program at Edinburgh where one or two days a year, the public was given free entry into fine old buildings, both public and private, in order to admire and appreciate them. She arranged for half a dozen people from Toronto, including several city staff, to go to Scotland to see for themselves. They were dazzled. The result was the first Doors Open program in Toronto in 2000, which had four or five dozen buildings in Toronto open to all Torontonians, the last weekend in May. It was such a successful program that it has been an annual event ever since. It has been adopted by some and many municipalities in Ontario, some across Canada, and copied in New York City. She's been involved in working to save many buildings and has retained her optimism even when the authorities are unsympathetic as they were with her important campaign to protect the views of the legislative building at Queen's Park. She has worked hard with communities to establish heritage districts. She is an outstanding architect, a fine designer, one of those rare professionals who understand the nuts and bolts of building, a lover of the modern as well as the heritage, and she has gained awards for her skills at architectural restoration and interpretation. One of the most high-profile heritage fights was the campaign waged with Margie Seidler to save the concourse building on Adelaide Street West. And the building is still there. Out of that work, as a communication strategy to create pressure to amend the Ontario Heritage Act so municipalities could stop the demolition of designated buildings, Built Heritage News was formed. A free online news bulletin, Built Heritage News has been published by Kathy with consistent regularity since then, bringing a wider array of information to an even wider audience in Ontario and across Canada. Its finest moment was a call to pack the gallery of the Legislative Assembly to watch the debate of the amended Heritage Act, and in the face of such support, the lingering opposition evaporated. Kathy's story proves the point. Never underestimate the power of one smart, energetic, and determined person who always thinks the best of people, 
searches out their good qualities and then has the ability to bring them together for a common cause. Jane Jacobs justly admired people like Kathy, and we do too. I want to end with a little poem by Lucille Clifton that captures Kathy's spirit really well, recognizing that her concerns and energy go well beyond heritage. Here's the poem. I am accused of tending to the past as if I made it, as if I sculpted it with my own hands. I did not. This past was waiting for me when I came. A monstrous unnamed baby. And I, with my mother's itch, took it to breast and named it history. She is more human now, learning language every day, remembering faces, names, and dates. When she is strong enough to travel on her own, beware she will. Thanks, Kathy, for your consistency, energy, and determination, and the innovative spirit you bring to complicated issues in our public lives. And congratulations. Uh, you're going to make me cry. It's, uh, hang on a second. I don't know how to thank you for such, a, such an introduction. And I want to thank Ideas That Matter for this recognition and for the little purse that goes with it. Uh, volunteering is expensive work. And yet as a volunteer, you can do exactly what you think is worth doing. I wouldn't have had that luxury without the support of my husband, Robert Alsop, who, thank God, continues to be a healthy workaholic. <laughs> thank you to friends and family who have come here, in spite of not knowing why they were being invited to, to witness this day. A particular thank you to my mother. <sighs> Sorry. Who raised five of us more or less alone. Every day, she communicated by her example the values of caring, sacrifice. <laughs> no, we're, I'll be okay. I'll, I'll, I'll be okay for a second. Hard work and perseverance. I've never had to deal with the challenge that my, that my mother did. <sighs> to be honored in the name of Jane Jacobs, but those who work closely with her mean so much to me. I'm not usually this easily upset. <laughs> I was in high school in, that Don Mills, in Don Mills during the Stop Spinarana movement, so I missed all that. And I really didn't have a sense of what it was about. I did have a sense that the suburban environment I was living in was problematic. Architecture school seemed like a place where I might find a, a way to build better places, so I signed up. I didn't encounter Jane Jacobs' ideas until Death and Life was assigned reading in the university. By then, I was living near the U of T campus and finding, finding living in a city center such a rich experience. University during the 70s was a time of excitement and interaction between the university and the city. David Crombie came to speak. John led council and became mayor the year I graduated. God, a mayor on a bicycle. <laughs> Perhaps that bike should sit permanently in the mayor's office as inspiration. Death and life was so important to me, and, and as it did for so many of our generation, it changed my life, my way of thinking. Jane asked us to see things as they are and not to be intimidated by the experts or anyone else for that matter. Over the years, I've had the privilege of gradually getting to know those who were directly involved in Stop Spadina. Ken Greenberg encouraged me as a professor at UT. John Sewell reappeared to interview me over the ideas to civilize the French Street Extension in 1990. Ken Greenberg and David Crombie helped too. I don't know why they had such faith in someone who had been designing fancy kitchens until that moment, but thank goodness they did. 
One of the sweetest moments of my life came at a meeting at the Waterfront Regeneration Trust offices. Jimmy Jacobs came up to me and introduced himself, saying his mother had said to look out for me. I was over the moon. I just couldn't believe that Jane Jacobs had, had noticed my work. I did have occasion to meet her several times after that as a friend of her friends and to seek advice through, through them. Mentors are so important. I can't tell you how often I've, had to, I've turned to John, Ken, Bob, Steve Otto, and my distant cousin, James Dunn by Naismith, for helping me in trying to figure out a way through things. I'm going to go back to the 70s for a minute. One of the most important experiences was just after graduation. Kim Story and I had a fantastic summer researching and analyzing on Ontario Main Street. The exercise of researching the history sufficient to draw it and put it together in, as an exhibition also taught us who lived, who worked, social, and socialized in such a small area. I later compared Main Streets to old growth forests because of the resources there and the gradual incremental process of change and renewal that Main Streets undergo. Businesses die, new ones start up. The key to Main Streets is the basic right to own a little piece of land and a building allows all the new ideas that need old buildings, renewal that occurs along these strips. Preserving those buildings preserves the places where new ideas grow. Heritage preservation is so much more than just keeping old stuff. It's more than the respect for the work of those who have passed on their legacy to us. Like the movement to keep seeds, our heritage buildings and neighborhoods contain important cultural DNA, knowledge we may need to turn to sooner than we, th we know. They contain irreplaceable environmental and cultural resources. Jane Jacobs pointed out the dangers of losing technologies in dark age ahead. Old urban patterns and building science evolved over centuries. The optimism of the 20th century came with far too much arrogance. The 20th century was like a rebellious teenager striking out only to come to realize too late that they should have listened. Ignoring the wisdom of our ancestors on how to make streets that work, grow good food, and make buildings that don't make us sick may have cost us the future of the planet. Diversity or monoculture? Main Street or expressway? Local or global? Jane knew what to value. I don't think I would ever have been able to ask any of these questions without the courage of Jane Jacobs to write as she did and the inspiration of figures like John and Ken who were so close to her. For me, even more important than death and life was systems of survival. I have passed it to my nephews and nieces to read. Almost every day, Bob and I spot another monstrous moral hybrid as we read about the latest scheme to mix public and private values and ethics. Perhaps systems of survival needs to be assigned reading to all political candidates. My roots in Toronto are deep. My father's family came in the 1840s. John Naismith served on city council. George Galley Naismith, who was about four foot ten, was a scientist who worked to bring clean water to the city. There's been a lot of talk about the absence of love for Toronto in the mayoralty debates. But love for one city is a bit like love in a family. The bonds are strong. Each generation hopes to make them one after it better than they were, to advance and pass on values. To love Toronto does not have to mean blind acceptance, cheerleading, or, or never being critical. Loving Toronto has to mean building on our strengths, keeping what we value most, and working generation after generation to make this place worthy of the great society that is housed here. To build a city that looks like we intend to stay here, not like we bought it at Kmart. Creating that great city cannot be done by studying a ledger book or by attrition. It will happen through pride, stewardship, and investment. Thank you again for this award and recognition. I can think of no finer honor than to have my name linked with Jane Jacobs. Tomorrow, it's back to work. Congratulations, Catherine. It's now my pleasure to introduce Mayor Miller, who will announce this year's other prize winner. Um, in a brief conversation with the mayor, he reminded me that I'm still in his employ and therefore I should take some care in how I introduce him. <laughs> um, however, I think it's obvious to many that Mayor Miller is somebody who cares deeply about this city. 
he had a close connection with Jane Jacobs, and he speaks of it uh, often in conversations about the city and what can change and what can make this place better. He has a great understanding of how cities work, and as mayor and prior to that as councilor, certainly had as his objective a healthy city, one that's economically healthy, accessible, livable, and one in which people thrive. Mayor Miller. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Derek, for following my instructions, which I meant be brief. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here today. And uh, to Kathy, uh, to you, congratulations. You uh, well-earned recipient of the Jane Jacobs Prize. Uh, many, many years of terrific and successful and appropriate advocacy. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you. Um, it's also my honor and privilege to announce the other winner, um, who uh, is actually several people which is the editorial team from Spacing Magazine, Matt Blackett, Dale Duncan, Todd Harrison, Sean McCullough, and Dylan Reed. I think the reception that was just given to that announcement says something. Uh, Spacing Magazine, of course, uh, is a very fitting uh, winner of this award because it, it expounds literally the spirit of Jane Jacobs. But it's also fun. You can tell by the whoops. Uh, it's young. It had five uh, uh, younger people, and two of them are wearing white shoes, which I don't know what that means, but it means something. <laughs> and white belts. Uh, from its beginnings in 2002, spacing has exuberantly celebrated the public spaces of Toronto and the residents who inhabit, use, and play in the city's streets, sidewalks, laneways, parks, ravines, green spaces, transit, and underground systems. And from my perspective as mayor, uh, in order for Toronto to succeed, we do need to grow inside our city. And you can't grow inside our city without having great public spaces for people to enjoy and to come together as citizens. And in a city where more than half of us are newcomers to Canada, let alone newcomers to Ontario from other provinces and cities, it's in those public spaces that you become Torontonians. And that's exactly what spacing celebrates. And uh, I mentioned at the beginning that people are young, they're wearing white shoes, and they're fun. Um, that fun to me is shown amongst many other things in the wonderful series of subway buttons that Spacing is famous for. And I have uh, Kennedy here because it matched my tie for no other reason. And if you ask Matt Blackett how this came about, he'll say he went to the TTC and said, I want to buy subway buttons. And the TTC, concerned with running the trains on time, um, understandably, uh, wasn't interested. So Spacing just did it itself. And to me, that sums up the spirit of spacing. And it's the spirit of Jane Jacobs. Analyze what you experience, not what the experts tell you that they experience, and make your own conclusions, and work together based on those conclusions to make your city the kind of place in which you wish to live. And that's exactly what spacing has done, not just in Toronto, but as I learned, uh, or was reminded, I knew this already, last night when, uh, when I went on the website, to read the interesting article by John Lawrence about a mayoral candidate who wants to rebuild the Spadina Expressway as a tunnel with no exits from Eglinton to the Gardner. A remarkable, a remarkable uh, idea. <laughs> yes, Adam Vaughn told me that uh, they're going to have to pave over the lake in order to accommodate the parking. Anyway, John Lawrence has an interesting article on this on the Spacing website. And when you go to the Spacing website, you realize that this group of uh, ed editors has not just created a connection in Toronto between public space and people and their city government. They've exported this idea across Canada. And I think it shows the resonance of the ideas because spacing looks very carefully at how the city works in a real way, 
what the street level dynamics are in Toronto, Montreal, Halifax, the other cities in which there's a spacing uh, presence, how we work together in the city economically, all of which, of course, are exactly the way that Jane Jacobs analyzed her work and where she lived. There's also a strong focus on the good things that are happening in Toronto. And there are incredible things happening in our city. We're lucky and privileged to live in Toronto. I think we should be proud to be residents of this city. We need to celebrate the strengths much more often. Spacing Magazine does exactly that. Sometimes the smallest thing, but a thing that makes a huge difference to a neighborhood like someone starting a community garden outside a high-rise building, a garden that builds community in the high-rise building, as well as supplying needed food. There's many, many examples for those of us who are fans of this magazine. Spacing and the editors always start at the level of the street and what is actually happening in the urban landscape. They reveal what's hidden, but should be seen and understood. For example, what's happening in our inner suburbs. There's incredible creativity in the inner suburbs of Toronto, often seen in our high-rise residential buildings. In fact, I just came from the National Film Board who was doing a project uh, called High Rise that started in Toronto and is going around the world. And that project uh, is due in part to the kind of work Spacing has done to talk in some of its issues about what's happening in the inner suburbs. A city is not just downtown. And there are vibrant communities in Scarborough, in Etobicoke, in North York, where the residents of high-rise towers come together to create the kind of community that they want. And Spacing talks about these issues and ideas as well. One of its great strengths is it's not just an advocate for a particular issue. With its collective team of writers and contributors, it promotes a healthy discussion of a whole range of issues from a variety of perspectives. One of the special things about Spacing is that it's drawn together a new generation of writers, photographers, illustrators, and bloggers who love Toronto, observe it, interact with it, and sometimes are quite critical about it. But always in a sense of how do we build this great city together? And one of the conclusions I've come to after seven years as mayor of this city is that we can build an inclusive, vibrant, prosperous city with opportunity for all. Spacing and the ideas it promotes are helping us to learn together how to do exactly that, not just downtown, but all across the city in a young, energetic, and white-shoed way. I can't think of a more appropriate winner. Congratulations to the editorial team at Spacing Magazine. Give yourself full view. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mayor Miller, for your introduction. Um, spacing launched days into your uh, days after you came into office, so our trajectories are are certainly uh, interwoven, at least at least in our minds. Um, we thank you for always for being uh, open and honest with us, and we wish you the, as much success as possible in your post mayor life. And good luck with that half marathon in a couple of weeks. Um, we'd like to congratulate Kathy uh, on her award. We love, we love her for her love of Toronto. She's been a good friend of Spacing since we started, and, we, and she's certainly deserving of this award. So congratulations, Kathy. And thank you to Ideas That Matter for this award. We're obviously humbled by this prize. Um, there are many other deserving people out there who are fighting for their communities and fighting for the greater good of Toronto. Uh, we appreciate this recognition and plan. Ooh. Um, we appreciate this recognition and plan to savor it for as long as we can and hopefully past October 25th. Um, we also like to, uh, yeah, yeah, it's gonna, it could be an interesting day. Um, we'd like to acknowledge our spacing contributors and friends that have joined us today, uh, Jordan Lawrence, uh, Steve Monroe, uh, Dave Meslin, Todd Irvine, Jessica Duffin-Wolf, uh, Mike Bolko, Emma Feltes, and two of our great mentors, Stephen Otto and, and Margie Zeidler. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, personally, I'd like to thank the, my, my colleagues that are sharing uh, this, the stage with me here. Uh, to, to Dylan Reed, um, he's been working on uh, uh, pedestrian issues for a number of years and is actually the co-chair of the city's pedestrian committee. I want to thank you for your leadership and writing for this. There's 
there's, there, there's uh, no coincidence that uh, or the policies in the city when it comes to walking have improved in the last four years when he's been the co-chair of, of that committee. Uh, Sean McAuliffe, he just uh, published a book called Stroll, which is probably the, the best book you can ever find on Toronto right now, at least the current best book you can find on Toronto right now. Um, it's the preeminent guide uh, to, for, uh, for urbanists if they want to walk this city. And I, and I think it's, it's, it's brilliant. And I, going on walks with you, Sean, has always been fun. We, we never knew that it would actually be part of the narrative of this city. And to uh, Todd Harrison and Dale Duncan, they've been the, the uh, editors of, of the magazine. I want to thank you for diligently and creatively working on the magazine and not only sacrificing your time, but sacrificing a decent paying wage in order to make space in what it is today. Uh, when Ann Peters called me to tell me that spacing had been awarded the Jane Jacobs Prize, I was out of town. I'm a bit of an urban geek. I go to cities to look at garbage bins and bus shelters and sidewalks and public squares. Uh, I, 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 I've, I've traveled across the U.S. on road trips, and I, and I literally stop and I'm like, look at that garbage can, look at that park bench. And, and, and uh, it's, it's those details that I, I love of cities. And when I was out of town, I was actually in Pittsburgh, and if anyone's been to Pittsburgh, it's actually a wonderful city. Um, it's got a kind of a crappy reputation, but uh, it's been fighting its way back from uh, the depths of massive job loss and, and environmental degre degradation. But when I returned home, I felt fortunate to be back home in Toronto. And this is a common feeling that I often get uh, when I visit other North American cities. It's because we have a special character here in Toronto, something that's almost, ab that's almost always absent from other large urban centers in North America. We have neighborhoods that connect instead of isolate. We have a downtown core that's a little people living instead of just working and shopping. And we have a vast network of grassroots organizations that are committed to making life a better, uh, better life for every Torontonian. Right now, there are people grabbing headlines by telling us what a crappy city we live in. Of course, they're wrong. We have a tremendous city. Everyone in this room knows this. I know this. These guys know this, and Jane Jacobs certainly knew it too. We have candidates running for mayor who are thinking in silos, sadly. Uh, they're sadly resurrecting horrendous highway ideas. Thank you for stealing my little bit. Um, <laughs> that died four years ago because of the, the work of Jane Jacobs and many of the people that are actually probably here in this room. Um, they're also proposing transit, public transit plans that ignore all of the intelligent and practical solutions that are emanating from other global leading cities. They seem more interested in being the chief accountant of the city of Toronto as opposed to laying out a true city building agenda for the city. We started spacing because we felt the issues that go into making a great, great city, whether they be walkability or clean air or smart urban planning, uh, they were being discussed in these silos. Uh, these issues are interconnected and depend on each other for each other's success. Luckily, I, I do have lots of faith in Torontonians. The polls don't make me think, feel that right now, but um, I think they can see through promises that can never be delivered. Instead of telling us what we're going to get, we need civic leaders or potential civic leaders to ask residents how they can help find the solutions to our everyday problems that our city faces. I meant that it's possible that the political narrative that will emerge out of our next city council could be a culture that just says no. Rather, we need a city that loves this, or we need a city council that loves this city and is always asking how. How can we build reliable and appropriate forms of public transit to all corners of the city? How can we make sure that our kids can walk or ride their bikes safely to school instead of always having to be driven? How can we make, and as Paul Bedford brought this up, how can we make our municipal government and our city councils work more effectively for us? The writings of Jane Jacobs are not the final ideas of how we build a city. There are templates. There, there are starting points. Um, my colleagues here, here from Spacing today, we've been trying to lead this, this discussion on how Toronto continue to grow into a healthy, vibrant, and, and sustainable city. We couldn't be more proud to receive the Jane Jacobs Prize. We want to thank Ideas of Matter again for this wonderful honour. Congratulations to the spacing team. And welcome to you and to Catherine, to a wonderful group of uh, fellow uh, prize winners. As you may know, the prize uh, carries with it the cash sum of $5,000 in each of three years. And I would like on behalf of all prize winners and others to uh, thank Avana Capital and Ideas That Matter for this prize and for that contribution. I would also like to give my thanks to former Mayor John Sewell and Mayor Miller for your 
presentations and to be with us this evening and hope that you can stay a bit and join us all with some refreshments next door that will start shortly. Thanks again and thank you all for being here this evening.